Thank you, Sameh, for that report. Still on education, according to reports, many schools in Ikorodu have complied with the state directive on COVID-19 guidelines. The Lagos State Government had last week directed Senior Secondary School 3 and Tech uh, 3 pupils to resume on August the 4th in preparation for their West African Senior School Certificate examinations, which, would start, which already started on August the 17th. So far, the schools are said to have put in place necessary measures that could prevent the spread of COVID-19 among pupils and teachers on their resumption. Reportedly, from the gates, students, parents and visitors' temperature were checked by the security officer with an infrared thermometer, while everyone was asked to use face masks, hand sanitizers before entering the school premises. We are being joined now from UK by Adi Mohammed, a Chapman School Career Specialist, and uh, Faye Ojigo, if we get hold of her, she's also the head of school, Green Springs Secondary School, Lekki Campus, and Aja Maimuna Sako, educationalist from uh, Senegal. Let's begin with Ladi. Good to have you. Thank you. Right. Now, um, schools seem to be resuming against the odds uh, in some climes. I'm wondering, what's the situation where you are in the UK? Um, well, from early June, when several countries around the world asked their children to return to school. There were differences in how schools managed the protests, and even here in the UK too. Um, some schools imposed strict limits on contact between children, while others let them play freely. Um, some required masks, while others made them optional. Some closed temporarily if just one student was diagnosed with COVID. Others stayed open when multiple children or staff were affected, sending only ill people and direct contacts into quarantine. Hence, the success rate um, varies from country to country and even school to school. Mm. One of the major concerns out here in the UK was should children wear masks? I saw from the um, video clip you showed earlier when the students were queuing for WIAC, they were wearing masks. Um, several schools here in the UK have decided it wasn't compulsory um, for children to wear masks as teachers needed to be able to read a child's face during classroom lessons. For example, if a child looked confused when the teacher knows, then the teacher knows to explain that what is being taught in a little bit more detail or to ask a child what they're looking confused about. Um, though the science is still r very unclear, but it does seem that children are not in high risk categories. Plus, there really hasn't been any conclusive evidence that wearing masks by children in schools, as they're in contact with people they're normally in contact with, um, that wearing masks in schools significantly reduces the spread. So schools here in the UK have decided not to make wearing masks in class mandatory. Mm -hmm. So you may class that as a successful outcome. Mm. I, I think um, that's a very uh, crucial uh, point that you have brought there, especially about the wearing of masks. Uh, even the World Health Organization is having conversation around that, how safe that is for children. Having said that, I'm just wondering how reliable are the measures being put in place to protect students, you know, in the light of the fact that there are a lot of factors that would be difficult to control, even you mentioning, you know, confusion and facial expression. Mm, exactly. Um, you're very right. I mean, the mask is one issue. Then there's the other issue, so other factors such as should children play together? In answer to this, schools here in the UK have been operating in bubble sizes in order to minimise the chances of spreading the virus between students, you know, this social distancing. Um, so some bubbles are per class group. From September, however, it will be per year group bubble sizes in secondary schools. So this could be up to 240 students in a bubble um, in secondary schools. Pupils can play with other students in their bubble, but not with those students outside of their bubbles. Mm. Um, Amma, the creation of these bubbles can be viewed as a successful initiative in tackling the spread of the coronavirus, as this reduces the chances of a child infecting another child. To me, there seems to be a level of risk that we are willing to take if a child's in school. Schools up here, um, schools really are where our children run around, play, laugh, argue with each other, as well as learn. So, you know, schools do a lot more than just teaching our children academia. Um, so there has to be a need 
to return to school right. in, in a safe and healthy environment. The UKR rate here has gone down significantly from when the virus first surfaced. Our government has deemed it safe for our children to return to school in September. We as parents and practitioners are trusting our government. Mm -hmm. You mean, know, mm -hmm. so, you know, another concern is what should schools do when someone tests positive? Right. You know, the short answer to that, Amai, is no one knows. Mm. That's largely because of a lack of data around how many silent cases might be brewing when an illness or two comes to light. Mm -hmm. I wonder, do we deal with, how do we deal with these infections? Do we close a classroom down or do we shut the whole school? Mm. You know, schools have decided to deal with matters on a case-by-case -case basis. Schools will often send an infected child home to quarantine for the standard 14 days, whilst keeping an eye on the whole bubble um, to, see, to see if anyone else gets infected. And where there's a case of two or more infected persons within a bubble, schools are prepared to that the whole bubble may have to quarantine for the whole for the standard two weeks. Mm. The I fact that we're considering these eventualities and putting in place these measures, to me, are successes in themselves. We're minimizing the chances of the virus spreading. Mm. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you, you have painted a very clear picture there, especially, you know, talking about children, the, the way they learn, they have to play around, they have to move around with each other, interact. But it's a complete new world, if you like, with COVID-19. Now, having witnessed the reopening of some sort, I, I'm wondering, how would you measure the success rate? Uh, and do you think um, more needs to be done, even to understand how best to allow children to function well, and even the teachers as well? Um, I think we're all keeping an eye out, on daily eye, uh, you know, eye out on the news to make sure that we're up to date with co what current best practice is. We're learning from other countries all over the world. Um, a lot of European countries, for example, found that the face mask was not as effective. You know, so hence for us, the success rate of minimizing the spread of COVID didn't the fact, uh, face mask factors didn't come into play. Um, as I said, mentioned earlier, like the success rate varies from school to school, really, and from area to area. Here in the UK, we've had certain areas have to go into local lockdown. So, you know, a certain city went into local lockdown, Leicester, for example. You know, in I'm in London. We're keeping an eye out there. We are putting, you know, social distancing measures in place to an effect in schools but not really because the truth of the matter is these are children that are in contact regularly with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they will be encouraged to wash their hands, sanitize, hand sanitizing will be made available. You know, so this, we can, I guess we're learning from each other. This is a pandemic. It's new to everybody. We're learning from what the, what the World Health Organization is saying and other countries are doing. All right. I'm just wondering, I'm sure that even as teachers, you normally have relationship with, you know, students and your, your pupils in school. I'm wondering what, what has changed with this new situation that we've all found ourselves? How do you cope with, you know, trying to relate to each pupil in the face of the pandemic? Very good question you asked there. Um, Put it this way, it's, t it's difficult, it's challenging in schools right now. Um, very simple things such as a child who is struggling with a particular concept, you know, looks distressed, doesn't quite understand algebra in math. We want to be able to, as practitioners, we want to be able to go over to that child and ask what's going on, you know, get closer to the child, you know, really sit down one-to-one -one on the table with the child. We're not really allowed to do that as much because of social distancing measures, you know, so it's things like that that we have to be conscious of. Um, you know, you can read a child easier without social distancing measures and without masks in place. So we've kind of made it that we've minimized the amount of distance that we need to keep um, from children. But then, you know, what do you do? Say, how do you tell the difference between a normal cold and, God forbid, COVID? You know, a child has a runny nose and is coughing or is sneezing, you know, do we start thinking COVID, COVID, don't let's go near that child? Or is it a case of what we'd normally do, which would be to um, give that child a tissue, 
or you know put our hands in our pocket and give our child that, that child a tissue so you know it is very challenging mm -hmm. and we have to be there we have to balance out you know the need to for to be health conscious with regards to covid but also the need to have compassion right. because that's our role as teachers and as practitioners Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I totally agree on that part of the need to have compassion. Now, I mean, generally uh, speaking on education in the UK, we saw the recent U-turn of a decision on how to assess the A-level students in the UK. What lessons can be derived from that experience? Oh, thank you. Uh, this, uh, we have, as practitioners, we have been through a whirlwind uh, these last two weeks. Um, the U-turn here in the UK meant the students in England were given their teacher prediction, predicted grade A-level results, as opposed to the Ofqual algorithm modifications. Ofqual is our um, qualification in the examining body here in the UK. So, um, however, if the pupils' moderated grades were higher than their teacher's predictions, the moderated grade will stand. Um, before the U-turn, this, this year's GCSE and A-level results were only partially based on teacher predictions. Teachers were asked to submit their predictions alongside a rank ordering of pupils in each subject. This was then moderated using an algorithm designed by Ofqual to ensure consistency between different schools and with previous and future years. Statistics used in the algorithm include pupils' prior attainment and importantly, the school's historic results. According to news outlets here, the algorithm's hierarchy meant that the performance of students, schools or colleges between 2017 and 2019 was the primary factor in calculating their grades. This led to criticisms of a postcode lottery with students from better schools more likely to get better grades from the algorithm. And that to me, the lesson learned here is includes not favoring schools that traditionally or historically do well. The algorithm was accused of being classist after the results were issued as children, as pupils attaining, um, attending schools which were, had historically received lower results were more likely to be downgraded. Mm. This seems highly unfair on an individual student basis. Right. Yeah, okay. thank you so very much for bringing... I was going to say, so going back to what happened here in the UK, in the case of A-level results, the algorithm downgraded 39% of predicted um, grades for students by teachers in England. 39% of pupils. Um, pupils from poorer backgrounds were hit the most, um, and this led to students losing places out in universities. Uh, the new system was highly criticised for seemingly perpetuating educational inequalities and the potential for high achieving students from underperforming or more rapidly improving schools to be unfairly downgraded. Mm -hmm. Ofqual's downgrading of results was not criticized by only schools, pupils and parents, but also increasingly by government officials themselves. Again, a major lesson learned for me here was that we should trust our teachers more and not waste time on algorithms. Right. To me, lessons learnt also include recognising that this has been a distressing time for students who were awarded exam results last week for exams they never took. The pandemic has created circumstances no one could ever imagine or wished for. It's important now, more than ever, that steps are taken to remove as much stress and uncertainty for young people as possible. Right. To free the principals and teachers to work towards the important tasks of getting all schools open in two weeks here in England. Expecting students, um, sorry, expecting schools to submit appeals where grades were incorrectly placed a burden on teachers when they need to be preparing for a new term and also created uncertainty and anxiety for students. 